You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Coming up on today's program. North Sea oil and gas companies set for near record income. Should they pay to ease the cost of living crisis? One of Scotland's two nuclear power stations is decommissioned after 46 years. And the climate scientists living at the heart of the Colorado community ripped apart by wildfires. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those coming up with the solutions. Now, oil and gas companies operating in the North Sea are set to see near record income in 2021 and 22 as international energy prices rocket. It's led to calls for a windfall tax to be levied on the firms, which could be used to ease the cost of living crisis faced by consumers. And as the companies continue to exploit the North Sea's resources, campaigners have warned of the detrimental effect on the climate. Our climate change correspondent, Hannah Thomas-Peter, reports. The cost of living crisis means Manchester-based John Lloyd and Kevin Doherty are already making difficult choices. After years of homelessness, they have just enough cash to live independently in their own home. But if their energy bills skyrocket as predicted, they'll be back on the streets. It makes reports of record profits for oil and gas companies, driven by those high energy prices, hard to stomach. It's a shame on society. I mean, these people, are, they, they have no idea what it's like to live how we, we're living at the moment. No. There's people out there who've got children who, who are really struggling at or how they survive. It's profits I mean, before people. Yeah. A recent report from energy consultancy Wood Mackenzie predicts that oil and gas companies in the UK's North Sea alone will announce near record cash flows of around £12.5 billion in 2021 and £13.3 billion in 2022. Those are levels that haven't been seen since the boom years preceding the 2008 financial crisis. Europe's biggest oil and gas group is among those benefiting. Shell has just announced soaring profits, mainly as a result of high gas prices. And it's the kind of thing that will only strengthen calls for the government to impose a windfall tax on the fossil fuel industry. That idea has caused a row. The companies involved argue that existing tax arrangements are enough. Given the extraordinary price rise for energy and the pain for UK consumers, why shouldn't you be asked to pay a little bit more in the form of a windfall tax? In doing so, you really disturb the investments in UK makers less competitive, drive jobs, energy and security supply out of the UK. And that really is in no one's benefits. You know, please, we, you know, we acknowledge we will be paying more tax. We want that to happen. Uh, and we want those monies to go where they're most needed. Campaigners say that's nonsense. And the only solution is an even faster switch to renewables. You cannot reconcile the fact that the UK is the second largest oil and gas producer in Europe and the fact that the government claims to be a climate leader um, and to have a net zero aspiration. I mean, there is no net zero future where we are continuing to encourage production of oil and gas. It's as simple as that. As long as fossil fuel companies are making money in the North Sea, those tensions will continue. Net zero carbon emissions by 2050 was never going to be easy but the energy crisis is making a hard job even more so. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News. After 46 years, Scotland's Hunterston B nuclear power station was decommissioned today. When operating at full capacity, it was capable of providing enough low-carbon electricity to power 1.7 million homes. Now, at its peak in the 1990s, nuclear power provided about a quarter of the UK's electricity needs. You can see on our data dashboard that the proportion has fallen. As I speak to you, nuclear power is providing just over 11% of the country's electricity, with gas at 38% and renewables, mostly wind, at 33%. Now, nuclear power is expensive and results in dangerous toxic waste, but it doesn't release carbon emissions, so is a valuable part of the low carbon mix as the country aims to be net zero by 2050. Sky's James Matthews reports now from North Ayrshire. From the Ayrshire coast comes a winter's tale about change. Change in the energy landscape. 
and in the landscape itself. When Hunterston Nuclear Power Station spewed steam on Friday at midday, it was breathing its last. The steam that once drove its turbines won't anymore. Hunterston is closing down. The overwhelming feeling is one of pride. Uh, we've been generating electricity for 46 years, uh, providing Scotland with a quarter of its electricity needs, and that's low-carbon electricity. Hunterston B has generated electricity for 46 years, way beyond its expected lifespan. Its closure has been brought forward after hairline cracks developed in graphite bricks inside the reactor. Proponents of the nuclear power industry say losing it will mean higher energy costs and greater reliance on imported fossil fuels. Opponents see it differently. Over the period where Hunters have been having so many problems, Scotland's massively grown its renewables capacity, which means the reality is that now that Hunters have closed, we won't really be needing that electricity uh, anyway in the future, so we're moving on to using far more renewables. Hunterston is a human story too, of hundreds whose working lives were spent here. Some came back to bid farewell. Sad. Pretty sad, actually. <clears throat> no, we, lovely place to work, great time at the power station. So many people who were very, very committed. It was to, exciting to too. Yes. It was the forefront, really. Of, yes, uh, well, it, was, it was very, really good. very exciting. Yeah. Doogie Graham will be among a majority of staff involved in a defuelling process lasting three years. A long goodbye to a long career that started aged 15. When you think of the, the, the carbon emissions saving, I think that's equivalent to taking every car in Scotland off the road for 19 years. So you put it into context like that, it's, it's quite staggering. The end of Hunterston will leave Torness on Scotland's east coast as its only remaining nuclear power station although Torness 2 is on the way out. On this industry, on this side of the UK border, the sun is setting. James Matthews, Sky News, North Ayrshire. Well, in some of today's other climate news, the chief executive of Centrica, the owner of British Gas, has called for green levies on energy bills to be scrapped to help customers facing higher energy prices. Currently, about 12% of gas and electricity bills go towards funding green energy programmes. The company argues that this funding should come from general taxation rather than taxes on energy use. An increase in gas prices has triggered violent protests in Kazakhstan, and the social unrest has in turn led to an increase in the price of uranium, crucial to the production of nuclear power. The strategically important Central Asian country is the source of 40% of the world's uranium supplies and the 10th largest producer of coal. Poland's ambassador to the Czech Republic has been sacked following comments about a controversial coal mine bordering the two countries. Ambassador Miroslav Jazinski said Poland had showed a lack of will to ease tensions over the mine after Czech authorities said it negatively affects the environment and drains water from local villages. Poland has refused to close the vast Turo mine, despite being ordered to do so by the European Court of Justice. Japan's biggest power generator says it will spend almost half a billion pounds on the development of ammonia-related technology. Ammonia is seen as an important future energy source because, like hydrogen, it doesn't emit carbon dioxide when it's burnt. The company, Jira, plans to invest in new ways of producing ammonia with the ultimate aim of replacing the use of coal in power generation. And Sir David Attenborough has lent his voice to a special episode of the children's show Hey Dougie to show the importance of plants. The naturalist has joined with regular narrator Alexander Armstrong for the programme in which he explains how trees and plants are the basis of all life on Earth. President Biden and his wife are due to land shortly in Colorado to examine the damage caused by wildfires on December the 30th. Now, the fires whipped through the suburbs, driven by winds of over 100 miles an hour and exacerbated by months of drought. Boulder, Colorado, is also home to many of America's leading climate scientists. We spoke to one who is still coming to terms with being at the centre of what she believes is a climate change-induced disaster. This is our community, and to watch it burn so quickly is something that I think we're all just struggling to believe and understand. I shouldn't be talking about wildfires um, in the middle of winter. It makes you want to choke up and cry. It's like Christmas just passed, and then, you know, everything that they went through is just gone. The 
the first sign that I had that something was wrong was seeing smoke filling out into the sky late morning. You know, when I saw the color of that smoke I, and I knew that structures were burning, you know, my heart just sank. That night, I kind of walked out um, to a hill behind my home, I literally see homes burning. And it's just a very heavy feeling, it's devastating, and this is nothing less than a disaster for our community. It's one thing to study these fires. I've been a fire scientist for 20 years, and it's another thing to see a fire in my own backyard and impacting my own community. I have staff who've lost homes. I have friends and colleagues who've lost homes. This has been a really challenging time for us. So what climate change does for fires is it sets the stage. It takes just a little bit of warming to lead to a lot more burning. I've never been so happy to see snow in my, in my life to put out that fire, but it's very unusual for us climate scientists to be talking about snow putting out fire. That's only happened one other time in my career. And if this isn't a smoking gun for climate change, I don't know what is. It's scary because it seems like Colorado weather just keeps getting more and more wild like this. The 100 mile an hour winds that we had yesterday, I don't remember having that years ago. It definitely seems like it's gotten a lot worse lately. Many of us now would consider ourselves climate refugees. And we're all asking ourselves, how many warming-related disasters do we need before we see real proactive action? Have a look at this. An artist has carved the word Chile in large blocks of ice and has placed it in Santiago's Forestal Park to throw a spotlight on the climate crisis. The artist Daniel Reyes is calling for the protection of the environment in the country's new constitution, which is currently being drafted. Now, do stay tuned because coming up here on The Daily Climate Show, I'll be joined by climate activist Laura Young and Professor of Political Economy at the University of Sheffield, Michael Jacobs. And we're going to be discussing whether oil and gas companies should pay a windfall tax to help counter rising energy costs and if veganuary can help people make real lifestyle changes. See you in a moment. Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show here on Sky News. Um, we're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day with climate activist Laura Young and Professor of Political Economy at the University of Sheffield, Michael Jacobs. There they are. Now, earlier on in the show, we heard how North Sea oil and gas companies are expected to make near record profits this year. Campaigners and opposition politicians are calling on the government to step in and implement a windfall tax which could help pay towards consumers' rocketing energy bills. But Oil & Gas UK, the industry's leading trade association, has warned that this could reduce the amount of money that the companies are able to spend on decarbonising their operations. So, what steps, if any, should be taken? Let's ask Laura and Michael. Um, good uh, evening. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Uh, Laura, let's start with you. To tax or not to tax, what do you think? The tax, definitely. I think it's important for us to recognise that a windfall tax is not a new thing. It has been across all governments and we've seen them in history before when we've had situations like this with unprecedented profits in different businesses. And I think the most important thing we should be thinking about when talking about taxing or not taxing is thinking about the people who are going to be most affected. And when we think about the crisis that we've been in with energy prices, it is regular people who are having to make the decision between food or be between heating their home. And that's something that is not just, and that's not thinking about the just transition. So I am in the tax bracket, I guess you could say, where we need to be taking these unprecedented profits that we've seen and putting it back into building up sustainable infrastructure, thinking about insulation, thinking about winter breaks, and thinking about being able to help people afford heating their homes, especially this winter. And I think it's about a just transition for regular people people and then of course still encouraging the fossil fuel industry to be making the transition to renewables with the other profits that they still make as well. Okay Michael what do you think because you've actually helped draw up windfall taxes in the past haven't you? 
Yes, I was involved uh, when I was a special advisor to Gordon Brown at the Treasury in 2005 in a windfall profits tax, which Gordon Brown as Chancellor imposed on the oil companies who, again, at that point were making uh, very high profits. Uh, and we specifically used the money, the Labour government used the money to increase the amount of grant that was going to uh, elderly people on low incomes to help them insulate uh, and warm their homes. And that is very much the proposal that is now being made with regard to the oil companies now. The point of uh, these profits, the, the, the thing that's really important to remember is that they're not a result of any effort uh, or activity at all by the oil and gas companies. They're simply the reduction, uh, they're simply the, the, the uh, pr product of the general increase in oil prices, largely because of supply chain issues, by restricted production, by OPEC and so on. So the companies haven't earned these profits, they weren't expecting to get these profits, and therefore that's the reason why many economists would say when profits like these are made, it is reasonable to tax them. The critical point, of course, is what would then be done with the money. If the money is then just generally brought into the government, well, that's good for the government, uh, uh, no doubt, but we are, of course, about to see a huge rise in domestic and indeed industrial and commercial energy bills when the price cap is raised in April, precisely because of these high oil and gas prices on the international market. That's why we're all going to see these energy price rises. So that's why the obvious thing to do is to take some windfall tax from these companies and put it directly towards reducing uh, uh, people's energy bills. Um, uh, and I would say also helping to insulate homes, because that, of course, is the long run solution to the kind of fuel poverty that we see so widely today. We need to have much better insulated homes so that we don't spend as much money on energy. Well, the arguments against the tax, um, some of them are that it will it will deal a blow to investor confidence in the UK's North Sea and also that if you're cutting that money, it will then cut the amount of money that these companies are able to use in decarbonising themselves. So, Laura, what do you make of that? I think this is when we need to remind ourselves about a just transition. And when we talk about transitioning over to a green, clean, renewable energy system, we can't be leaving consumers and regular people behind. And that is who has the short end of the stick when we think about this. And that are the people, those are the people who can't turn on their heating because of these prices. And so I just don't think that's a good enough argument. And I think we need to be seeing the progress quicker. And they've got the infrastructure, they already have the resources, and they need to be doing it out of their own pockets as well. OK, well, let's uh, leave tax there and move to something else because it is January and Veganuary has risen in popularity since it was introduced back in 2014 with an estimated 580,000 people giving up meat and dairy this January. UN experts say switching to a plant-based diet will significantly reduce your climate impact, but how much of a difference can Veganuary really make? So let's start with you, Michael. What do you think? First of all, are you have you signed up to Veganuary? Uh, I haven't, but I specifically, but I uh, have cut down on my meat consumption hugely over recent years. Uh, I'm not quite vegetarian, but I'm uh, quite close to it uh, now. And that's partly because my children have all gone vegetarian, or nearly all of them, um, and because uh, we found it just more healthy to eat uh, less meat, um, as well as for environmental reasons. And I think I'm like many people who are eating less meat. The scientific facts are pretty clear, which is that uh, the world uses a huge amount of the available land uh, on which we can grow food to feed animals. And when that those animals are then turned into food for people, um, it's much less efficient. And, and we, in a sense, waste a huge amount of land that could be available to grow people, uh, grow food for people, uh, growing food for, for animals. And in doing so, we're then destroying nature in order to create uh, those food, uh, that food production. So the environmental case for eating less meat is very strong. My own view is that, uh, is that if veganuary uh, helps people uh, do that, then it's a very good idea. We're very social animals. We like to do things that other people are doing. It's easier if uh, if we can experiment with changed lifestyles. This is, after all, really a matter of changing our habits. Many people have already done that. Many more uh, say they would like to. And I'm sure uh, that veganuary is a way of helping people change their habits in that way. What do you think, Laura? Do you think people who actually do it for a month then go on to say, oh, well, that was easy. I'll do it for the rest of the year. I think it sets a tone and maybe people will pick up a few more recipes 
or a few more brands that they would love to try for the rest of the year. I know particularly lots of new things as well come out for Veganuary. So there's lots of different products to try from every supermarket and in lots of restaurants as well, which is great. But hopefully people will also see that throughout the year, the seasons will change. And particularly when we think about Britain, January is not our best month for what we grow, but hopefully as people enter into some of the summer months and maybe towards August where we have bumper harvests of things that we grow here in Britain, they'll also be able to embrace different types of vegetarian or vegan foods and be able to be inspired to pick this up throughout the year and maybe carry on some bits. And I know lots of people who have stuck at it for the whole of January before, and then they might not have gone fully vegan, but they've definitely changed and made lifestyle swaps. And that's probably what the main point is to get people thinking and get people changing and doing it together for a bit of fun as well. Michael, what do you think? Do you think we should be promoting this kind of thing throughout the year, not just in January, say asking people to, you know, not eat meat for one day or week, just briefly? Um, uh, I think many people are calling for that. Uh, and so this isn't simply about uh, one month. It is about uh, changing our eating uh, habits in general. And any ways in which people can cut their meat consumption uh, will help the planet. There's no doubt about that. OK, thank you so much, Michael and Laura. Thank you so much for talking to us. Now, do remember that you can also listen to our weekly podcast, Climate Cast, which is available now wherever you get your podcasts. This week, we take a look ahead to the year ahead and ask, will 2021 be the year of real climate action? Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.